And this discussion is actually going to be interesting as a follow up to Helen's discussion when we think about project help. Uh, think about it a little bit more as a case study. So we're going to be looking at PyLadies, explicitly building a global PyLadies community with GitHub Actions. Uh, asterisk, a work in progress. Uh, unfortunately, I apologize the slides aren't coming through, um, but the little, a little bit of background information about me. Um, I do a lot of things in technology as kind of my awesome introduction from my fellow, my fellow helpers said, uh, I do a lot within the Python ecosystem, explicitly working on PyLadies Chicago, and I'm also a, Py, a maintainer of the PyLadies project. Additionally, then I work in the Python ecosystem as a chairperson and director of the Python Software Foundation. All that to say that I really am super, super excited about Python. So for PyLadies, one thing that I think is, in, uh, for those of you may, who may not have heard of PyLadies, I'm actually gonna be talking to you about the PyLadies community explicitly about how PyLadies intersects with the broader Python open source ecosystem. So for you to think about what is PyLadies, I would like you to understand a bit about when we think about how projects have the impact of bringing diversity and inclusion to a broader ecosystem, what are some of the pathways that people have into getting started in open source? Explicitly, if we were thinking about PyLadies, the story of PyLadies began in 2011 when we were at Py PyCon 2011, which is the largest Python gathering for Python developers or Pythonistas as we call ourselves when a group of passionate Python programmers, including Audrey Roy, Grenfield, Esther Nam, amongst many others, were talking about a same challenge that they had, explicitly trying to understand how they can learn more about Python. Out of this desire to want to learn more about Python, Audrey actually continued this thinking about this discussion and, and when arriving back home in Los Angeles, started working on a project that became what, what, what we call today PyLadies. Within the Python open source ecosystem, there's actually, as I mentioned, the Python Software Foundation, which has a grants program which funds different initiatives, including in-person events, as well as developer sprints and many other things that help us contribute to the quote, promote and build a diverse global Python community, which is part of the Python software mandate. PyLadies, it then has since become a community that we can broadly say is an international mentorship group that's focused on helping more marginalized genders become active participants and leaders in the Python open source community with an emphasis on education, outreach, conf uh, conferences, in-person events, as well as just really wanting to highlight and promote folks within this community to become contributors and maintainers in the Python open source community. So, Interestingly, from 2011 to 2015, in the early years, kind of seeing some of the success that PyLadies had, uh, early organizer and PyLadies member who does all the things, Lynn Root, wrote a update on the impact of the PyLadies project titled and linked here called Diversity, We're Not Done in 2015, wherein she was exploring and looking at the intersectionality of user, group, of user groups alongside the introduction of highlighty spaces across the across well the world and in looking at such groups like Django New York uh, New York Python as well as looking at one of the other biggest Python user groups which is the Boston Python user group uh, as well as some others I, it, it was apparent in the data that we were starting to see more and more of an uptick of members if you we were if we were looking for example at meetup membership groups with the introduction of these auxiliary communities in the Python space. Add in that in the subsequent years for PyCon, diversity chair Jessica McKellar also began discussing the impact of how we were starting to see some of the movement of thinking about diversity and inclusion from the perspective of gender, where if we look at PyCon, talks that were given by women in 2011, which was at 1%, has now increased to be over 40%. And this was, again, this is a data point from 2016. That stat has continued to be over 40% with PyCons up till today. 
Additionally, then if we look then at the subsequent, uh, at another space where we think about inclusion in open source is looking at the actual Python language summit, which you can see the stats that are kind of presented here. Unfortunately, these stats are not as good as we would like them to be. But if we began thinking about how there was, for example, no, um, no women that were core Python developers and hence you no know, women participating in the Python language summit for, for a myriad of reasons, we started to see that number to increase over time. So while this is all this is all great. We've seen that we've seen more and more folks that identify as PyLadies members. We're seeing the impact in the community from the from core language contributors to meetups to conferences. For us to really understand and think about the health of diversity and inclusion in Python, it's a complicated task to take on. The Python ecosystem is very vast. You may be talking about the scientific space with Python, which is just a graphic here on the left from uh, Jake Vanderplas talking about the many ways that Python has many projects in this space. Or we might be talking about Python and web development, or we might be talking about Python and gaming, or we might be talking about Python in the Internet of Things if you're thinking about such initiatives like MicroPython. And this was actually a challenging question that many of us were thinking about within the PyLadies community when we began to look at where are the women in Python open source? Uh, PyLadies New York uh, organizer Rashama Sheikh actually wrote this write up in, 20, in late 2019, looking at the Python system, uh, the Python open source ecosystem, and began kind of comparing to other languages to see where we were trailing. And from data that was gathered from the gender ratios of programmers, a 2016 data set, which again is gender inferred, not self-reported gender, we saw that Python was really struggling at 2% as compared to some similar languages like, the, like R, which is at 9.3%. Which then led us to a renewed discussion about thinking about how to scale PyLadies to a global model. In 2021, in looking at the growth of the PyLadies project, uh, there was a 2021 State of PyLadies report that Rashama had written up, as we can see on the next slide in this graphic, where we have about 260 groups. But interestingly, what we noticed with the growth of our community is most of the growth is not happening within the United States and Europe, where the early chapters were started. And actually, a lot of the growth, as you can see, is coming from such places like South America or a burgeoning growth in places like Africa and other places that previously had not been on the radar in the early years for the PyLadies space. In the subsequent slide, we also then continue to see that, again, the, the breakdown of the most active chapters, again, continue to be outside of these areas that early organizers were coming from. Um, in particular, PyLadies Brazil has a significant amount of chapters and is very highly organized and has a lot of momentum. So moving then into a discussion about thinking about the future of us and what we could do within the PyLadies Pi ecosystem, we began to understand that the landscape of who's being included is not actually meeting people where they're at. Ultimately, on the next slide, some of the early organizers, uh, in fact, including Mariata, who will be speaking tomorrow about automation in Python, uh, core Python development, what we began to identify was that we were not actually scaling to meet our global members. And on the subsequent slide, what we see then is we actually developed a different governance model to help us think about how we can better meet people where they're at, where we set up a, a global leadership team and then these individual project teams that are meant to be managed as open source teams. So as an example, there's this tech team here that's highlighted, which would be an autonomous team that can go ahead and work on initiatives of their own choosing that sits under the PyLadies Global Council. So on, the, sub on uh, the subsequent slide, some of the challenges we began identifying in the PyLadies project was then thinking about pathway friction points or rather pathways that prevent PyLadies members from getting involved. And some of the biggest things in our technology stack included as an example on the next slide, some of the challenges that, that we found is that we were not 
when we are introducing our documentation to people, for example, installing the PyLadies module that introduces PyLadies to people, we were not localizing. And then when people were actually getting and arriving to our open source repositories, they were, they were actually having friction points and actually understanding what the process was to actually start new chapters, to actually register as members and move forward. So part of what the PyLadies project has been doing now has been thinking about those very explicit tech friction points that we can automate away. And we've been using a lot of tooling in the GitHub ecosystem, including GitHub Actions, to help us set up these, these action workflows that upon moving into the main PyLadies repository, you can spin up an issue which basically helps bootstrap you to getting your new chapter website developed to actually getting the pull request going to help you connect with the tech team of reviewers who are on standby ready and willing to help you get onboarded and to get started in participating in the pie ladies community and ultimately things that are continuously moving forward for us and thinking about growing this project and thinking about the health for our project is how can we expose people to the pipe how can we expose people to the tools that they need to learn how to contribute to Python open source projects while also being a member of the community. And the tech team has actually been leaning a lot and thinking about workflows that we can better manage with some automation like things like GitHub Actions to help us meet people where they are at. And ultimately, this is going to lead us to the next set of challenges that we have, which is going to be identifying and continuing to do data collection around where our members are at, what are the friction points they have, and then helping us curate a, a series around how to be a contributor. Ultimately, this, this leads us with the last note on what's on the horizon for PyLadies, which is this how to be a contributor series. If anyone is passionate and does participate in projects that they would like to talk to our community about, we would love to hear from you. And you can, you can grab and submit uh, on this form that is a link here that you can look at on the slides after the fact. In short, I want to thank you a little bit for talking about how we think about diversity inclusion within PyLadies as a bridge to helping build open source um, initiatives and opportunities in other places in the Python ecosystem. If you have any questions, please reach me on social media. And thank you so much for my behind the scenes tech support. You are all amazing for helping with the slides. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lorena. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I love the work you're doing, and I love that this is uh, that PyLadies is, is making an effort to include more and more people uh, into the fold. So thank you so much. And um, Lorena, if you have a chance, um, will you be around Gathertown after this? Yeah, I will definitely be around for a little bit.